I think when you use things like Next.js, you're basically signing a, do a legal document that says you're willing to take on this liability, this yeah. burden. But for the, the benefit you get is you're a, a lot more productive to launch your MVP. Yeah, it's like, like yak shaving is zero. But yeah, the, exactly. It, but amortized yak shaving over the next two years is not exactly. non-zero. You know, it's like yeah. you're, you're spreading you, you over. Yeah. yeah, instead of shaving one yak today, you're shaving three yaks. yaks yeah three yeah. yaks next year and then 40 <laughs> yaks the year after yeah, yeah. and then like a thousand yaks the third year <laughs> flaming next js and versal cost is always gonna go viral <laughs> that too <laughs> you can that only too. you can only you can only alienate rouch g so much though before before it starts becoming a problem Welcome to the Highlight Podcast. I'm Jay, the CEO of Highlight. And with me, we have Esplin, an engineer on our team and the producer of this podcast. And last but not least, Zane, a good friend of Highlight, formerly the co-founder and CTO at Pipe.com, which is an embed embedded financing company. How's Pleasure it going, guys? Here. What's new? <laughs> I see Esplin has a new haircut. Uh, always good to see that. Always looking sharp. Yeah, Thanks. but do you shave that daily? Is that like a is every, that, what's the every other day? If I go every, every day, day, it's a disaster. I see, I see. What's the is shape? The, what's the shape if you don't shave? You know, like what's the you, shape of what hair is missing? I'm curious. Or is there oh, hair missing? I, the, the, so I've got I've got like fuzz to here, and then it's just like this. I can grow great hair around here. That's oh, great. I could I grow see. a whole like chonmage and like fold it fold it over forward. It'd be great. Have you considered uh, putting a highlight logo into your head? <laughs> like, oh, like shaving it in? Yeah. Like, I mean, well, no, you already have the curve, you know? You could just put like... <laughs> I just need a little Just bit an more. idea. Just an idea. You know? Okay. Just get you thinking. I'll take it, I'll take it to my barber. Sounds I good. mean, Jay, I see you're growing a nice mustache over there too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Shave it every two days because it just goes wild otherwise, you know? So is that is that a thing at Highlight? You guys shave your shaving regimens are synced together. Yes, yes, it's part of the bonding process. It's part of the bonding <laughs> process. We have little nice. shave meetings at the end of the day. We all get on Zoom and like shave together. Yeah. Uh, wow! Yeah. Well, yeah. that's that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, um, I'm also the head of HR, so there's no problems there. But at some <laughs> point, we might need to put that in some document somewhere. But yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Zane, it's cool to have you. Thanks for coming. Um, I wanted to start with a little bit about your programming background. Um, I feel like you and Esplin actually are known for not having the typical engineering background and kind of just getting into it by osmosis and learning yourself. Um, so yeah, Zane, tell me a little bit about how you learned how to code and how you eventually got into startups. But let's just start with, yeah, like how did you learn how to code? I mean, it was a lot of uh, uh, tutorials initially. Uh, there was this, the, the initial exposure I had was uh, this PDF called Learn Python the Hard Way by Zed Shah. Um, okay. It was just 50 Python exercises. It was literally the first thing I ever did. Uh, but then I was reading books and getting more into uh, the hardcore programming side of like, uh, algorithms and CS, uh, uh, ultimately like the, the two books that I feel like really benefited me were SICP, the structure and interpretation of computer programs and, uh, KNR's book on C. So I don't know what KNR stands for. It's two authors, Kernigan and Ritchie. Okay. Um, uh, they, they actually, those guys created Golang or one of them or both of them. Uh, oh. but they wrote, yeah. So they're on like the ghost steering community or something. Um, they Got wrote it. a book about C that really teaches you about how C maps into memory, how pointers work, how data structures work on the memory level. Uh, and that was really nice because when you first jump into programming, especially someone who's self-taught, there's all these data structures and objects that seem really arbitrary. Like, why is a list a lit? Why is why are why is everything a list in in Python yeah. or a dictionary, right? And when do you use one or the other? And why why if you have a list in a dictionary, why do you need a linked list, right? Yeah. So yep. 
Uh, and it, it builds on that. And then like, if you have those, why do you need a binary search tree? Um, and then why do you need red black trees? Right. And it just keep, it, it really starts at both of these books were really cool because, uh, they start from fundamentals, like in, and see like the way to think about how stuff maps into memory is like the idea of an array and then dynamically allocated arrays. And then in Lisp, the only data structure, you worry less about its memory representation, but the only data structure available in scheme Lisp, which is used in uh, SICP is uh, pairs. So everything is a pair and you compound pairs to create lists. So like uh, oh. uh, a, a list is just like, a pair where the first item of the pair is an atom and the second one is another pair. And then you go into the second one and the first item of that second one is an item and the second one is another pair. So you learn to create every sort of data structure, including lookup tables, uh, arrays, everything from just pairs. So Got it. It, it, it's a really elegant way to learn programming. I think, uh, because nothing seems arbitrary anymore. You build everything off pairs. Uh, Got it. Got it. Did did you did, what? Or go ahead, Asplin. Yeah. Did you have a lot of math background going into this? No, not at all. Not at all. I I like took a stats. I took a statistics class, and I did pretty bad in Calc one. Although, like I I did pick up math years later. Uh, I got, but I was just a, a terrible student. So wait, you okay. what, what walk us through like your education. So where did you go to school and what did you study and then what? Uh I studied uh so I I went to U of M, University of Michigan. Okay. Uh, I was initially a neuroscience major. I I pretty much finished that degree except for one class genetics. Uh, Got it. And uh uh I transitioned to finance. Um and at the end I, of college, like towards the yeah. end. It, I, I, I was actually ahead of schedule on the neuroscience degree. I finished, I was going to finish it in like two or two and a half years, but then Got I it. switched to finance halfway through the four years. And I actually graduated in five years with a finance degree. So oh, wow. I, I did an extra year in undergrad. Uh, but you didn't get the neuroscience. No, I was one, I was like one class short. I just couldn't handle genetics. I, I had a really terrible lab partner and I just, I didn't want to go oh, through yeah. it. That is yeah. tough. That is tough. Yeah. And I was going to, you know, I didn't want to just grind through for the, the degree. Um, sure. Uh, but I took a lot of interesting classes. Nice. Uh, yeah. It was, it was fun. What about you guys? Jay, what, what were you studying? Cause you, you were, I, you, when I met you, you had, you had been at Google brain and then you were in a YC company. So how does yeah. one get a job at Google brain? What do you study to go there out of undergrad? I feel like in call, so I had a more traditional background, I would say, on this in like computer side of things. Like I, I started college wanting to do electrical engineering, and then I went after about a year. Some friends of mine introduced me to like hackathons, and that was what I was doing every weekend for the next like wow. two and a half years. And that's kind of at that point, it was just like I was going to be a CS major one way or another, whether or not like whether I, whether I change my degree to just take more cs classes or change my degree in the first place if that makes sense um but that's kind of how i got into it and then like i feel like i just became good at networking at like conferences and hackathons and stuff like that and that's how i met the deep mind sort of like got into that sort of world i would say but maybe it wasn't it, I, th I think it was also just like I had built a bit of a resume throughout college, just having done a few other internships. You know what I'm saying? So like I, I did intern at other places before that. Um, but yeah, it, it was also definitely lucky. Like I feel like they don't, it, because they're based in the UK, it was just like a bit of a crapshoot, you know, but. Wait, um, who's based in the UK? Uh, DeepMind, which is like Google's like okay. uh, AI research so arm. Okay, so that arm has always been in the UK, not in the US. Yeah, and they actually don't even hire in the US. So like, I just met them at a conference one day, and then like, I hit it off with this guy, and then he was like, "Oh yeah, sure, I'll send your resume." And then I was like, "Yeah, sure, you'll send my resume." That's nice. yeah. Wait, I, so I, did you have? To, did you have to move? Yeah, yeah, I was there for like a year. 
Dude, that's yeah. super cool. I, I that's that's why I ask because I've I've never encountered an, someone who has worked at Google DeepMind straight out of undergrad. Um, sure, it's not something they, especially from American schools. Um, but so I'm curious, like, were you studying uh, flavors of AI in undergrad, or were you just more on the CS path? And like, what 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 was that interview like, and what uh, what were you yeah. studying for, for for that to work out? Yeah, so it was very, it was very much a still like a CS or like a software engineering position. So the questions they would ask you were software engineering type things for sure. I feel like there was some stuff that was related to AI, but it was more like distributed systems, like you know, like as you can imagine, like training and all that kind of those sorts of things. But it, they're they're definitely generalized to problems that you would have at maybe a more traditional software engineering company you know um but then at at actually at deep mind it was cool like they put you through like a crash course on neural networks and stuff like that so it was like free wow. sort of i was on like free school having done the internship kind of thing or the internship and the job so that was pretty cool but yeah it was pretty it was pretty traditional so more so than yeah, i think you would think um even given the like the logo you know yeah, I, I mean, so you you were initially Eeks, and then you got into CS because hackathons were your gateway drug. Exactly, hackathons were my gateway drug. That's Esplan, very cool. What about you? Oh, I I got into this on accident. I I my brain is more like of a, that of like a lawyer. I'm more English and like language focused and much, I struggled much more with math. Okay. And so I actually, I was almost done with an econ degree at BYU, decided to add a finance degree. So I doubled in econ and finance. They're kind of short degrees, got all done in four years. Okay. Went and got a job in 07, got laid off in 09, was unemployed for 10 months and decided I actually need to learn how to do PHP or I'm just going to fail. So I taught myself PHP. What was that? Like, what was the thing that made you think that you had to learn PHP? Was it, you were in the Bay Area at the time, right? I was in the Bay Area. I came back to Utah. Everybody I knew was going to law school or getting an MBA. And so I started studying to get an MBA. And then I realized, wait, I'm going to be competing with everybody this year yeah. for an MBA. Yeah. Like, this is stupid. And then I'm going to spend a quarter of a million dollars and be in all this debt and not make any money forever and then be like an indentured servant to some four to 500 company after that. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized I could just spend that time and that money learning how to code. Why wow. don't I just do that? But was there like a thing? Was there like something online or a person or something like that? That was like the coding thing is worth trying. Cause it, it is a bit like it's very, it was very different than what you originally were thinking of doing right in the finance world, you know? So I ha I did eventually get a finance job at a, at primary children's hospital in downtown Salt Lake. Okay. And I was working doing finance, but it was incredibly monotonous. It was all just Excel, copying and pasting and giving people um, copies of these reports. Okay. So I started trying to automate it. And then I realized, wait, I can automate my whole job. And so I literally automated my whole job into SQL <laughs> calls and whatever. And then I got a new job, automated that job. And then I was two years oh. in now to like automating my job. And okay. So you sort of like job. learned it by doing like you were like, you just realized the maybe the potential of being able to write software. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like computers should be doing this. Why am I copying and pasting all day long? This is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes a ton of yeah. sense. And now we're thinking now it's like, should, should we even be thinking, you know, like computers <laughs> can just think for us, you know? Yeah, like, they could write all the code. But exactly. But that's fun. I, I have a question for you. You said I gotta learn PHP, right? You were you were all about PHP. Did you do uh first off, how do you say did you do Laravel or Laravel PHP or just that wasn't out back then? So that was always that, that was mm -hmm. twenty ten. Maybe it was, but I wasn't aware of it. So, you know, the reason I ask is uh I think PHP is like the ultimate productive language. It gets a bad rap in modern programming circles, but it seems like you can just get shit done. And it's amazing because you're combining the rendering of the HTML with the backend. So you yeah. don't have this whole front end backend separation. Uh, and a lot of the most trafficked apps on the internet are PHP apps. Um, yeah. Did you have that experience of extreme productivity when you were writing PHP? 
My first, so I learned it on sort of playing with WordPress where I started to learn it. Yeah. And then I wrote a job. I was working at a hospital. I wrote a, no, I was working at, a, well, I was doing genealogy work, munging genealogy data. And I wrote like a many thousand line PHP file that would like munge all my data for me. And yeah, it was incredibly productive. They used that application I wrote for them for five years after I left. Wow. Just, no one could figure out how to replace it, but it was just unreadable, unmaintainable, but it did the thing. That's, That's like me, so but cool. it's because my code is so bad, you know, like <laughs> no one knows so how to horrific. replace it because it just, it runs, <laughs> but no one has, knows how to fix it, you know? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but it's so cool how, uh, programming is one of those careers or I don't even know if you want to use the word career, but skills that, uh, there's like a giant community of people who are self-taught and you don't see that for other professions or trades as, as often. And the other thing about programming is that while there are people who get an aptitude for it when they're young or in college, like Jay, you were hackathoning when you're 18, 19 years old, which is mind blowing to me because I was out there scanning people on RuneScape when I was 18, <laughs> 19 years old uh, and playing WoW and, you know, just generally wasting time but uh uh it's like back in the day when you look at the way that people went into a profession it was through trade mentorship um and i feel like for programming there's this giant community online of people that are willing to mentor you and answer your questions and nothing like that exists for any other profession like if you go on to a random irc channel or discord bot or uh, or Discord room or whatever they call it, uh, Twitter or Stack Overflow, you can ask like luminaries of the field will answer your question uh, yeah. no matter yeah. how, no how, how noob of a question it is. It's mind-blowing. It's, mind it's actually, yeah, it's like, um, it's almost like the hippie profession. You know, it's like the, you don't need, you just need to be able to put the work in and you don't need like, a uh, uh, super high class college degree. You don't need to have worked at all these big companies or whatever it is. You don't need to have like really wealthy parents and you can kind of just be successful with, with what you have. And I feel like that is if pro if the programming field didn't exist, it would kind of suck for people like us, right? Like we would have yeah. to have gone through the, the, the regular motions of getting the, an MBA or going to law school or becoming a doctor. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Um, so exactly. it's pretty beautiful in that sense too. I, I would agree. Um, yeah. It, what but, you said reminds me of a, a Paul Graham quote where he discussed, uh, uh, you know, people ask him like, why don't you just get a corporate job and work at a big company? And he's like, well, technically there's nothing wrong with eating roadkill. If you cook it, you're killing all the bacteria. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel about like big yeah. company jobs. Is, there's technically nothing wrong with it. It just doesn't feel right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially given the opportunity to just go and hack out on your own and work for work with dudes who or folks that uh, are you know <laughs> keep it keep it folks, but work for folks that it's okay. I'm you know, the head of sh HR. Sh shave their head, shave their heads every two days and sink it. Like that's yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, programming is one of those weird crafts that maybe it's like music where it's almost like it, it's kind of basic. It doesn't cost a lot of money to do it. It's not a money thing. It's a time and dedication kind of thing. So true. So true. Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is why it sort of unlocks. Like, I feel like there are a lot of people that that crave the crave the eliteness of doing something, you know? rather than the working of hard, hard of doing things. And maybe there is a place for each of those types of people, but it's cool that it unlocked more opportunity for folks that want to like learn and do the work and all that kind of fun stuff. But, yeah, for sure. Um, the next, okay. Zane, the other thing I wanted to ask about you, ask you is, so Esplin's, Esplin's like stack to get started with programming was the PHP thing. What was yours? Uh, yeah. It was, it was initially Python. Uh, I did this like learn Python the hard way, but then uh, I went down the rabbit hole of Scheme Lisp 
Uh, okay. okay. Because Python felt overwhelming initially. It felt like, like I was saying earlier, like there's all these data structures and objects and built-ins and there's this weird underscore underscore in it thing on yeah, classes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it felt like I was just memorizing so much stuff uh, to, to get it all to come together. And so I kind of took a step back and, and went down the scheme rabbit hole. Uh, okay. But then you can't really use like, for someone who is uh, really junior and just picking things up, like there's a lot of yak shaving. Uh, this was a term that I was taught. Have you guys heard the term yak shaving? I've it's heard like, it. It's like uh, when you, all the schlep you need to do to just uh, have a server running on the internet that serves a web page, all the infrastructure you need to install, the networking configurations, all of that stuff. So Scheme is terrible in that regard because just to install the flavor of scheme that was in that book, I had to like find a weird binary on the internet and run it on my computer. And then I had to like configure it just to get it to run on my Ubuntu computer. Um, yeah, we got there you go. Right here. Exactly. So that to me was like the worst part of programming. And to be honest, like just as a side point, point where we are today is a, a million times better where, than where we were like 15 years ago or 10 years ago um, in terms of like developer productivity on your local machine. And there's all yeah. these things like Replit, which let you work in the cloud without even thinking about your environment. Um, but so after Scheme, then I came into JavaScript and Python and HTML and CSS because it felt like a really pragmatic way just to be productive, like write server code in Python, uh, use a SQL database, and then do the front end in JavaScript and HTML and CSS. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, what, uh, yeah, like I feel like the whole PHP world and the, just the server only writing server side code. It reminds me of like next JS today, you know, with all the, like the idea that you can write code and it runs on the server, it runs on the client, all that kind of fun stuff. And it is cool that I feel like, I remember in college, for example, at the hack in the hackathon world, it was very common for us to, you know, you write a Flask server, like you just always split up a Flask server. That's the first thing you do in Python, right? And then you write some React app that hits the Flask server. And it was a lot of yak shaving to just get yeah, that for even sure. run, up and running. Um, so it is kind of cool that we're going back to our fundamentals, but like with more modern tooling with the Next.js world and all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, I mean, Next.js is such a leap in productivity. Like, you can for sure critique it. Like, the common critiques are some of their APIs seem unstable and, and poorly documented. Uh, and uh, certain parts of Vercel are overpriced. But sure. it's indisputable that if you, read the, if you read the manual and you follow the directions and maybe you struggle through a few things, it's by far the most productive way just to get shit done on the internet. And uh, it's it's really magical how effective it is, yeah. Productivity yeah, wise, yeah. I've definitely yeah. had that experience. I've been switch moving in that direction, especially with React server components. All of that old PHP stuff's coming back, and we're, be, we're able to blend SPAs, client apps, with server side apps, and it all kind of blends together. And you can have most of your app server rendered. You can have nav bars server rendered separately from the rest of the app, and then you can have like a little reactive portion in the corner the, there's the, just so much you can do yeah the, and you're exactly that's that's exactly the the vibe you have is you can everything just is integrated together in such a clean way that uh if you want to launch a production ready app it's almost ridiculous to choose something else but the other side that balances it is that Back in the day, it was really easy to debug stuff and understand the flow of information and where things are rendering. Like, there's so many times where you get this weird stack trace in Next.js and you're like, I have no idea where this is going wrong. And yeah. you have to be like a Next.js domain expert. And when those bugs hit, it's the worst feeling in the world because there's no straightforward way to debug it. And I remember back in the day when you had the more client server, traditional client ser server client model. It was supremely easy to debug things. It was supremely easy. And I think there's a part of me that is nostalgic for that, where it felt a little bit more, uh, I mean, 
you know, the ultimate thing is you want to be able to peer through abstractions when you need to. And Next.js takes that away from you. Yeah. Um, this yeah. allows you to especially, peer through. Yeah. Especially with their like edge runtimes, their fancy, like once you get it on Vercel, it's even more like you can't run those edge runtimes locally. So you've got to deploy it and then read the stack traces in their logs and hope you can actually understand what that means. And, exactly. and Zane, we've like, like anecdotally, like we've spent so much time helping teams introspect their Next.js applications that when Esplan's saying this edge runtime stuff, this is like actually things we're, we're trying to send traces from the edge runtime. And it's just like no fun, you know, like wow, a lot of, wow. a lot of those, a lot of, yeah, but, but again, it's, you know, it's cutting edge. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons why the tooling around it is not really defined yet, uh, but it's getting there. And I think the, you know, every few months we see an update happening that makes this, the highlight experience easier, so on and so forth. So um, hopefully it gets to a point where it is as easy to debug those kinds of things. But I do think we're a, a good amount of, we're, we're good. There, there's a good amount of time before that won't be, before that will be the case, you know? Yeah. And it may never happen. Like, I think, I think when you use things like Next.js, you're basically signing a doc, a legal document that says you're willing to take on this liability, this yeah. burden, but for the, the benefit you get is you're a, a lot more productive to launch your MVP. Yeah. It's like, like yak shaving is zero. But yeah, exactly. It, it, but amortized yak shaving over the next two years is not <laughs> exactly. non-zero. You know, it's like yeah. you're you're spreading you over. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of shaving one yak today, you're shaving three yaks. yaks. Yeah, three yeah. yaks next year, and then forty <laughs> yaks the year after. Yeah, yeah. And then like a thousand yaks the third year when they exactly. upgrade. When they do a major exactly. breaking up to upgrade. Yeah. 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 Um. Okay, anyway, so okay, next thing I wanted to ask um was about um I guess maybe just randomly just curious saying like are there any cool programming things that are happening in the world that you want to that you're curious like that that are that that you're excited about? Yeah, in, ter in terms of like open source or uh Sure, open source things, um new paradigms I'm just kind of curious. You're a good I mean, guy. I feel like you read a lot about this sort of stuff, so I'm curious. I mean, I think uh uh local llama uh running oh. running llama.cpp. Okay. The, the running uh, I should say running uh local LLMs locally on your computer is super exciting. Uh Have you tried any of that stuff? I have. I have like I I will I have a Linux computer with uh an RTX 3090 it's 24 okay. gigs of uh virt of memory and yeah. uh it can run like uh a 70 billion parameter model uh slowly wow. if you configure it and uh it's wild that like these these files are maybe like between 30 and 90 gigabytes uh the model that you download from like hugging face or torrents yeah um, and the amount of information they contain seems to be vastly larger than the file size. Yeah, that to yeah, me yeah. is a miracle. Like you download one of these guys, and I think I think it's actually small. I mean, maybe with compression, Wikipedia is smaller, but to download like simple data sets, they exceed the size of these models, yeah. and these models contain all of the information in in these data so so it's a pretty magical experience to download one of these models and then prompt and then send queries to it sure uh, i'm not sure if that's even the right terminology but to to send it prompts and see how it responds and it it's so magical that i literally unplugged my network from my linux computer because it just seems too good to be true that you have that much information in one file i think that yeah. is simply mind blowing that's crazy. And I it also makes me think that like when if and I hopefully it's when like Apple adds this kind of stuff to Siri, it's just gonna be insane. Like it's gonna be insane. I I've I, I I went I I had like a two week period where I did back and forth talking to Chat GPT. Cause like some I don't know, someone said that it might be a good way to like ideate or something. And I just quickly like was like, this is too slow. Like it was actually it was very fast, but it, it was like a one and a half second turnaround. Like I'll ask a question and I have to wait one and a half seconds. But I just feel like there's a point at which 
it gets so fast to where it's it, it's it's just a no-brainer you know what i'm saying and i don't think yeah, we're there yeah. yet but um yeah that stuff's kind of crazy stuff's kind of crazy it, it, initially when it came out when gpc3 came out i was like on the skeptic train i was like this sure. is not that special i'm not gonna start not writing code but yeah. then as like gpt4 came out and then claude opus came out i i i, I probably code gen like 90 percent of the code i write uh nowadays wow um but but again it it, it varies by projects like if you're if you're basically creating a Next.js app where you just need to like SEO optimize it and make sure the right SEO tags are there and it's mobile responsive, these LLMs are fantastic for that. They will spit out code that looks like decently good enough. Uh, and it, you will, you will just like write prompts and chill and sip your yep. coffee. But for other types of code, it's totally unsuitable today. But, uh, I think it's, it's changing. And side note, have you guys seen the code editor cursor? I've heard of it. I've heard of it. I, I I don't write code as much as I would like to, but I I it's per, it's basically like a trained on your code base editor, yeah? Yeah, and and it just has like a really nice interface for editing code. Uh 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 it's a fork of VS Code. So if you're familiar with VS Code, it's like literally drop in. Got so it. it literally will import all your settings from VS Code and it it is a fork of VS Code. So the the cool feature of of that is you highlight a block of code and you hit like command k and then you're like you you just like give it a give it a, a command to refactor it and it it will go through and edit it so an example a concrete example of how cool that is is uh let's say you have a nextjs component that has like uh static params being passed to it you can like command k and say hey uh, we're, we're also having, uh, refactor this to take these additional static params and it will take a best guess of how to use those params based on the variable names. Oh, uh, damn. It, it, it's wild. actually, so again, it's not perfect, but, uh, it'll like rewrite the component to like be more rich based on what you said. So like, let's say you have like a URL structure where you have like slash topic slash tubs, subtopic slash slug. And you've yeah. created like the slash topic page. You just paste that into the slash subtopic thing and say, refactor this to also include a subtopic param and it'll just do it. And then, oh, damn. For the following. And it, it's just very clean and quick. And then, uh, kind of my workflow is like after you've refactored and created these simple components, paste that bad boy into Claude Opus and say, make this beautiful. Okay. And it will like, and make it mobile responsive and it'll like take this like dinky little component and like and you can say like use tailwind ui comp classes it'll sure. create like a beautiful it will actually create a beautiful page and probably the most annoying part of this process is that is prompting because when you prompt claude opus or gpt4 with like the right extra fluff words they do a better job and that is actually a a bit of a burden where it, when yeah. you have to say like, you're so good at this. You're so good. At, you're an exceptional, you're exceptionally good at design. Uh, you write, you write really semantic tailwind <laughs> CSS. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. you have to like write a paragraph of like praise and then you get like better outputs. <laughs> and like, well, and that's even, that's even the case for the, the post prompts, like the prompts after that. Like if you're not verbose enough, sometimes you're yeah. like, oh, damn it. I wish I added that one other thing. And then you exactly. got to redo it. And then, yeah, I, I, I do agree. And that's kind of why I think that the voice interface is going to be so powerful. I was, I was thinking I, I, there was a, there was a company that launched on Hacker News two days ago. I forget what it was called, but basically they were building like an, a text editor where you could like talk to it. So you'd be like, Hey, um, can you write something that it requests this, this, and this, and then it will read in your, what you talk to it about. And you could, when you talk to it, it's not e explicitly what you want it to write. You're actually talking to the model. So you could be, you could basically like, you know, when you talk to like uh your tech, when you send a text, sorry, I'm trying to understand how to say this, but you know, when you send a text message using Siri and sometimes you screw up the word, like you're yeah. like, Hey Zane, how's it going? today uh 
are you free uh, tomorrow? Uh, like you're just like kind of screwing it up because you can't think of it fast enough. So this yeah. model actually reads in what you're saying and you could actually edit your text to the model uh, proxied by what goes through the text. So you basically, you could basically like, oh, can you rewrite that real quick to add this at the beginning? Can you add an emoji after this section? And it'll proxy what you're saying to it before it writes the text. Does that make sense? That's super nice. That's so it's it's like an additional layer of filtering before it hits the processing. Yeah. And it decides when it wants to hit. So you don't make that decision, but it's smart enough to wow. know that yeah. So anyway, I mean, those kinds I, I of mean, things it's, it's changing it, so fast. It's uh, people are people are constantly building better tools and it almost yeah. feels like a golden age of like being a being in in programming. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think I'm almost thinking like all this cursor stuff you're talking about, Zane, would be so sick if I could just talk to my computer, I would think. I don't know, though. I, I just think like me talking could be faster than me writing, assuming the screw up part of it, like me screwing up, is fixed. I don't know. Maybe not. But Okay, well, so, so I, I love that idea of talking because my dream would be writing code while walking outside. That would be a dream because the worst part of our profession is we're sitting in front of an LED light box yeah. for six hours a day. And if, if I was able to go and walk through the forest and have like a thin projection of code, or I don't even know, I'm not even, <laughs> I don't even need thinly projected, but I could just like say what I want and it's getting done. Yeah. It's wild. That's, that's even a possibility. It's yeah, wild. Yeah, that, yeah. And, and we're not that far off from stuff like that. I think we're not. I think we're not. I agree. Um, yeah, we are quickly converging to the Star Trek computer. Yeah. <laughs> you, you just say computer, and it just, just happens, and it works, and it's perfect. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, I've been getting you... relative to, relative to uh, LLMs and code, I've been using Copilot to teach myself Go. Wow. I did not know Go a couple of months ago, and I'm actually – getting okay with it just literally by prompting copilot do you think you're do you think if you got if you cut off from copilot you could write better go than you could two months ago i can write go which is better than two months ago so yes oh okay 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 because two uh, months ago you couldn't at all uh, I, it was pretty rough i, I still I, I still i don't I think where it shortcutted me is it's it's robbed me of understanding all the syntax like i don't know the syntax that well because i sure. start to do it and then it Auto completes the syntax, yeah. so I'm skipping over the syntax and just going straight to concepts. Yep, yep, yep. Which may be a good thing. Like, I guess yeah. it, it may just be the future that you don't have to worry as much about syntax because your code editor is just like, we know how to fix that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Dude, cool. it, it, it's a it's a it's a good point, and I think that's the other thing. The use case for these LLMs is like learning, and uh, you're able to access so much information without getting distracted with a million different sources. Yeah. And you're able to build, learn stuff in the context of projects, not of like grinding through books. Um, yeah. And there's something you guys, to be said. Oh, go on. Sorry. No, no. I was going to say on that note, have you guys heard of perplexity? Yes. The search engine. Yeah. So like I, I, I've been used, I use that very often, actually. That's the one thing that stuck for me actually recently is I use that the last two months. I'll, I'll give you guys a demo. But like, what is that thing that I was looking up? What, what I was thinking of just now, like um, Hacker News post about an audio tool that writes that writes for you. I don't know if this will work. Okay, well, it's wrong. But anyway, it basically will come up with an answer, but then it'll also cite its sources. That's very nice. The citation is nice. That's yeah. what I wish uh, the the chat LLMs did because then you can like dig into stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's pretty cool. It's like a, it's like a, and then like weird queries that you have. Like yesterday or last week I was out of the country and I was like, does Lufthansa give me a first free checked bag and if so how many kilograms is it allowed and you know what i'm saying like weird things yeah. that you multi-level questions that it would definitely require multiple links it's pretty cool but anyway that's awesome 
Yeah, I mean, do you guys think that Google usage will decline? Uh, like, that's that's the question. Is do you guys think Google usage will decline? And before before you guys answer that, keep in mind, I think Perplexity uses Google as a date as its primary data source. So, like, Google has this crazy moat of data, but they just seem. I, I actually think they're they're the Gemini thing is subpar compared to the other guys. But do you guys yeah. think Google search goes down? What's your opinion on that? I've I've been using Gemini a lot next to ChatGPT and Google Search with their inline AI stuff. They're all better at different things at, the, at this point for me, for my use case. I think the preferred way to interact with it is going to be more like perplexity because the, the, the link clicking through links and hoping is just, I think that's going to have to go away. Yeah. I, like I for think actual questions. I agree with, I, I, I think that Google won't go away unfortunately like just unfortunately for the startup world you know like it's like it is cool to see these companies like perplexity come up right but i do think everything that perplexity does google has in their like beta ai thing that you can turn on if you want on search i think the problem for google will be making as much money as they currently make because when you do this sort of thing, like sure, the citations are valuable, but I think more often than not, the text answer that you get answers your question. And you're just like, I don't care about the citation. So, But it's just a matter of time before the ads start entering into the LLMs. Yeah. And that's where maybe the open source models and those types of things would win, I guess. So yeah, it is, it is, a, it is an interesting race. I don't know. I don't. I didn't actually think about that, Esplan. Like the whole like, if they introduce ads, I'm just going to go to Claude, or I'm going to go to Perplexity, or I'm going to go to something else. But I do think in the current state, I don't think Google's will lose their search volume because they can just do what those those other those other guys can do, pending the ad decision. Well, so the, the the thing is, is that if you look at Claude and these other things, they're not free products, like the premium version of their LLM. So they don't oh, necessarily need to it. have ads. So if, if you if you use it all the time, you may as well get the premium one if it costs two Netflix subscriptions a month. Um, but uh, kind of the thing I wonder about is like, it it really feels like the way Google has indexed to the web, like taking a step back here, Google has done like a, uh, a feat of technological marvel. They've indexed the entire web better than anyone. And you can query it faster than anything. Like Google, Google runs faster than the average startup and even the best startups. And it's in it, it, it it's dealing with like literally a billion times more data. Literally yeah. an order like many orders of magnitude more data. They have an incredible infrastructure that is just unparalleled compared to any company right now, in, including uh, these cu these cutting edge LLMs, like the the amount of data they've indexed is just on another level. But yeah, it still feels like despite that, it's not like they're producing an LLM that is orders of magnitude better than the other guys. And that's interesting to me. That's not what I would have expected, especially considering that at one point Google had more than fifty percent of all machine learning PhDs employed. I think there's like a statistic. That's yeah. curious to me. Yeah. I agree. It's almost like re-leveling the playing field, right? It's yeah. like there's – but it sucks for Google because everyone's just using their work, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, they so. were benevolent and, and open about it. But here's the here's the other interesting question I have is what do you do in – like if right now like the way people get discovered if you're like a startup or a new company is – you either do ads or you show up on search engine results. Yeah. And like, how do you get, how, how do people, how do you discover the web? Like the web, you like back in the early days of the web, it was like a very much a directory structure. You get discovered if you're on a directory and people were trading links, link exchanges. And there's a whole net, like the web was modeled by a network of links, like hrefs all around the internet. And yeah. Google's innovation was page rank, which was, you know, applying the way that research papers are ranked uh, by, you know, citation. And uh, uh, the more citations from credible sources you have, 
the higher your page rank. But nowadays, uh, if Google goes away, how do you how do you weight what is important on the web? Um, yeah, and if I'm and and as a follow up, if I'm a startup and everyone is using something like perplexity, is there a different thing I should be doing to make sure that I show up in perplexity results? Yeah, yeah, it's uncertain. I think it's uncertain, uh, and you know, kind of like the organic way to grow is like SEO and write great content and people will find you, but that could change if Google is not, Google search is not dominant in the future. The search yeah. could really, I feel like it's, it's going to end up at least at the beginning, really benefiting the larger players because, you know, it's going to be hard to break in. Like it's already hard to break in with SEO, but I can just see it getting much, much harder to break in. And you'll end up having to break in. Like I've done some, some small, small side projects where I, I do all my marketing just on Reddit, just chatting with people on Reddit. And that is, that is the best I can find. And I wonder if there's going to be, if you do, we're just going to have to innovate and find new community ways to do that, to avoid getting crushed by you know, just the fact that you can't inject your stuff in LLMs anymore. But yeah. I would, I would maybe disagree. Like, I think that actually, AI, assuming that this perplexity thing tries its best or something like it, right? Tries its best to be unbiased. I think if you write content that is actually unique and answers a particular question, maybe you'd be more likely to be the actual answer that gets rendered in the perplexity results than, than the big player that just, you know, hires so many SEO agencies and just tries to like write crappy content, you know, I don't but, know. But Maybe will not, they then but... go buy my thing? So I, I, I'm explaining to them, say, for example, how to use, how to use like, the, I, I'm working on this photos application. I'm explaining sure. to people how to use Google takeout. Will they then realize like I'm explaining about why it doesn't work. So they'll buy my, buy my thing. So they're, they're going to do research and maybe I can talk them into I don't know. It'll answer questions about Google Takeout that I'm delivering to them, but it won't necessarily put them on my site and and promote my my solution. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know. I don't know. Interesting stuff. Yeah, it's gonna but be yeah. it's, it's gonna be hard to. I think I think marketing is gonna change a lot for internet stuff, but it's hard to have a strong opinion on exactly yeah. how it's, it really it's hard. is. I think I think maybe even like more in person stuff might just happen, you know? It might just yeah. be that like field marketing is like the new way to just ensure that you have to get in front of people or whatever. Or maybe that'll just budgets marketing budgets might increase in that space just because it's more certain at least in the short term, I don't know. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. But anyway, okay. So, okay, it's 10:15. We're 15 minutes over. Do we want to keep going or do we want to call it? I feel like we've had a good conversation. Dude, um, this was an awesome conversation. Yeah. Very relevant to the times. Very relevant to the times. I loved the Google Brain story. I loved Esplin, your PHP story. Like that that stuff is like A plus content, unique content. You don't, you're not going to get anywhere else. Also, there were good jokes, you know, about like the yaks. Yeah, I feel like yeah. those are good shorts, Esplin, that we can cut up. Yeah, and are like good intros on Twitter. Yeah, like you know? dude, flaming next JS and Vercel Cost is always going to go viral. <laughs> that too. <laughs> you can that only too. you can only you can only alienate Rouch G so much though before before it starts becoming a problem though. Yeah, before he like does some <laughs> crazy stuff. Yeah, because like so many sites are run by that. But yeah. Um, anyway, okay, we'll call it then. Um, thanks, Zane. This was really fun. I'm almost like we should just add Zane to random like podcast invites now when we have a fourth as a fourth guest just to kind of like keep the conversation interesting. Dude, I'm I'm always down to just be a fourth wheel. Earth, okay, Earth, okay. Wheel. sounds good. <laughs> this was fun. Cool. Take care, guys. Peace Stay out. Stay in touch, fellas. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.